and low fuel consumption and the CO2 emissions. I think that people have heard of CO2 many, many times. Also want to improve the durability. You can maintain the same uh, 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 fuel economy, but if the tire can last longer, that means you will a uh, longer time to produce use the tire. Of course, then noise is another environmental issues and uh, also the safety is important. So in order to create, to produce green tire, it's not just to say, I want the tire uh, have the best fuel economy. That's not difficult to do. The difficult things to do is to balance all the performance requirements you need, or at least maintain. You look at the rubber, I already mentioned it. We have synthetic rubber, and I have a natural rubber from rubber tree. Now the study have a new natural rubber from, I have to show you how to read this word, next slide, and also dandelion, okay? Dandelion, okay? So basically, uh, you look at the next picture. This is a natural rubber potential, you all know the next one. Wayuri, Wayuri is natural latex from the bushes in the desert. Okay, people already developed this this material to replace the net, net, uh, the natural rubber from tree. Okay, you can see the total different, you know, the senior senior view. Okay, next one is then the, okay, this then we look at the roots, the continental in the big uh, number four tire company already developed the, 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 the species. They are going to, to basically buy the big farm and to, to plant this in order to collect the latex from this. Okay, next one. Okay, back, uh, back two slides. Okay, so this is uh, on the natural rubber side. And the filler, we talk about carbon black silica basically from industrial product. And people have tried to cold starch. Cold starch is used at home. And the clay, and the also natural product. And also, you try to recycle the rubber to cut the rubber cycle with small particle. And the oil, people have tried uh, orange peel, Jesus P.E. oil, okay? And uh, soybean oil, some frosty oil. This, and uh, those oil is not from the petrochemical industry. Okay, next one. Okay, crystal. Okay. They have already used this new source of natural rubber made a pipe. Okay. So they already 100% new material. And also the Cooper type have already made some component. So this commercial product is not too far away. So look at the CO2 uh, regulation. This is regulation, but actually how do people implement it? It's a totally different story. You look at the Japan and Europe, pretty good. In China, it's pretty good, right? The regulation is good, but people don't follow. Okay, like the Arabic shows. The, 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 in China, the CO2 you know, emission is very high. Next one. So what is rolling resistance? I don't want to be you to be a scientist, but basically, is when you roll a tire, what kind of resistance you will have. Once you have a resistance, resistance tire has to change the shape. You generate a lot of heat. Every time you generate heat, that energy is lost. So very resistance is say, okay, this tire, how easy I can roll, some, those, roll this tire down the road. Okay? This is the way we have the rolling resistance coefficient. Basically, smaller number is better. So you can see one tire in the running, they have deformation, air, uh, dynamic drag, create a lot of uh, uh, heat, then this is an energy loss. Next one. So why is it important for the low rolling resistance tire? We'll call it energy saving tire. Basically, for the fuel economy point of view, if you have 10% rolling resistance reduction, you have actually 1 to 4% fuel saving. Okay. And also, for the greenhouse gas emission, save one gallon of oil, equivalent to about 80 pounds of CO2 emissions. Of course, then if the tire is more energy efficient, you don't have to fuel the gas 
offer as you su supposed to be, so you save money. So this is the strategy how to develop the energy saving time. Many, there are many. First, you want time. Light. Some people probably noticed, uh, I think it's BMW, the new uh, electric car. The tire looks funny, very narrow. I think Xiaofen mentioned of uh, uh, the Dunkway mentioned to me. The tire looks really funny, skinny, and big. Because they have to minimize the contact area to save the energy. So, Lightweight of the manufacturing process or how you design the shape of the tire and the new material. So the low reason coefficient I mentioned just an indication about the uh, from 8.5 to 7.3. So this each year people try to, especially the OE customer, like we work with the GM and the Ford and the BMW, they always can say, my target this year, 2005. 15, 7.7. Right now they are going to talk about it in five years, drop to 6.5. So it's a lot of challenge to the tire industry. Why is it so difficult? I mentioned that to reduce uh, the roofing is not a big, big deal. The difficulty is we have a so-called magical triangle. You have to balance rolling resistance, rolling resistance wet traction, and uh, uh, abrasion is the basis of mileage. So use the traditional material. You change, you improve one, you lost the other one. So the only way is to use new material to enlarge this magical triangle. This is our effort right now. Okay, here I just give you an example. Don't worry about the picture. The picture only I tell you is very difficult. Try to modify or create a new material. Okay, this is the rubber. You have to and a lot of different uh, function group around the rubber chain. Okay. So it's a lot of chemistry. The difference is, this is a picture, you can see a lot of the spots have the black there. And if the new material, you have much uniform uh, picture, we call it dispersion. People also change the filler. Okay, the same purpose, try to produce the well dispersed the material. Okay, so for the environmental friendly type, we want to use sustainable time materials or biodegradable time material. We want to have the energy saving tire. Of course, then you want the, the tire also can last the longer so you don't have to change the tire so often. But at the same time, we have to focus on say the low the fuel consumption and the CO2 improvement durability also inhibit uh, in, in, in some of the uh, material. It's not good for the house. And the noise reduction, this is also very big in Europe. We're not going to talk about it today, but it is one of the environmental issues too. Okay, to summary, the high impact on the environment, I already talked many times, because it's so durable, that it creates a lot of uh, environmental issues. But the good news is at least during the service, those where the particles are safe. At least the study is shown right now. Next one. For the environmental friendly tire technology, basically we want to lower the lower resistance of the tire and use the renewable materials. And uh, that's our goal and everybody is working on this. So that's my presentation and uh, we come do I have time to answer questions? No. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, can I get a question? What? Uh, the speaker cannot hear. <laughs> 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 Maybe able to answer this because what we use retire as retire. Retire. No, no, I'm talking about retirement. Okay, we say I'm going to retire. Yes. Then why would you use retire? It's a trick question. Uh, yeah. It's not a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Is something to do with the tire when it comes to this definition of the tire? <laughs> I don't know. Oh. <laughs> that must be a bad question. This is a bad question. Okay, answer. Dr. Chu, I'm not an expert on tires. But since I, I hope you're not, because otherwise I don't want my job. <laughs> 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 
since I have retired, so I can probably ask one question now. Earlier you talked about natural tires, okay. So the traditional way was using those, whatever, those uh, liquid from the rubber tree, okay. And right now, you're all trying to produce the tire from different plants. You call them natural. But why the ones from the traditional way are not considered natural? Okay. The natural rock from the uh, rubber tree primarily grow in the South Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. But right now, look at Malaysia. A lot of people rather to plant the plant tree, plant oil tree, because you can make more money of this. Also, the natural rubber tree is will affect the rainy season. If you have rainy season, long rainy season, you cannot produce good or enough latex. You can see the rubber, uh, natural rubber price go up and down very rapidly. Every time you you short up to natural rubber, what do you do? You go to the synthetic rubber, right? So you are using non-natural uh, rubber. And uh, for the dandelion, everybody knows dandelion can grow everywhere, right? Your backyard, the highway, everywhere. And uh, also the, the other, the desert bush also can be grown. So that's the two alternatives which have a very good potential to replace natural rubber from net, uh, rubber tree. Very good question. <laughs> okay, we will save some of the questions at the end, panel discussion. Now, I would like to introduce the next speaker. We have the honor to, uh, to invite Mr. Mickey Daniel uh, from uh, Georgia. Uh, Mr. Daniel is a team leader of energy efficient, efficiency education coordinator from Georgia Power. He's a graduate of Georgia College, where he received a BS degree in health and physical education, and a master of education in health and physical education. Prior to join Georgia Power, Mr. Daniel was a science teacher at the Warner Robin High School. So he's, today he's going to teach you something. <laughs> the topic is energy education from Georgia Power. Let us give uh, Mr. Daniel. Um, pardon the accent, it may be the hardest accent to understand today, right? <laughs> but um, at Georgia Power, we consider ourselves citizens wherever we serve. So one of the things that we are in the foremost and forefront of our business right now is renewable energy. And so I kind of summarized the whole uh, symposium today. Is what are we doing in the state of Georgia? And what are we doing in the southeast to minimize some of the impacts that we may see on the environment? And then trying to transition to what my team does, I actually have a team of educators that actually go into schools to teach students about energy efficiency and STEM careers. And as you were sitting here today, there's so many ideas and careers around STEM, but so many of our students across the state do not realize that there is a shortage of engineering or other kind of technology fields. And so that's what we do. But as we move through today, we're going to look at what's driving the renewable energy market. And most of you know that one is the tax credits here in the United States. You have a 30 percent tax credit for residential, and that's a credit that's not a, uh, basically you have to have the tax liability to take that. And so we see that a lot. That will disappear at the end of 2016, except for commercial and industrial care uh, costs is going to be reduced to 10 percent. But also technology. We've seen the cost of solar panels reduced in the last few years. Anybody know what it cost per watt for solar electricity to install solar? I mean, that's a good question, my master's. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere in the range of five to three dollars per watt on a residential to industrial scale. So you say, well, how much money is that? Well, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but 
right now in Southern, we have uh, about 1.6 megawatts of renewable. At the end of 2016, we'll have 1.5 megawatts of solar. Now, if you guys can do a quick math there, and you multiply that times $5 per watt, you see that solar panels themselves would cost about $8 billion to install. So I'm just trying to give you some comparisons. But previously, until the last few years, that cost was in the $12 to $10 range, and we've seen it come down drastically in the last few years. Also, large wind turbines. The technology has improved where they're much more efficient, so we're getting a lot more energy out of those turbines. And then finally, national policy. We've, we've talked about policy, we've talked about global change, and we've talked about Kyoto Protocol and some of the other things that have been driving these discussions. And so, right now in the United States, we just passed, or it didn't pass, the EPA sent out some new guidelines for the Clean Power Plan. How many of you have heard about the new Clean Power Plan? Very few. One. So the Clean Power Plan basically is part of the 111D, which is the Clean Air Act, where the, the uh, EPA says that basically by the year of 2030, the United States will reduce its CO2 emissions by 32% based off of 2012 standards. That's a pretty large goal for us as a, as a country. And that part is no longer proposed. It was a few weeks back, but it's actually now written into the uh, actual national record. So why do our customers want solar? We did some internal research. We have a green energy program. If you guys want to be green or greener, since we are part of the green symposium, we had a program where you could pay an additional five to ten dollars to buy a certain amount of megawatt or kilowatt hours on your additional bill. So if I wanted to buy an additional 500 watt hours or kilowatt hours of energy, I would pay an extra five dollars. And then if I wanted a thousand, I would pay an extra 10. And what that said is, George Power, we promised to go out and buy this amount of renewable energy. So these are the customers we surveyed, because these are the person, people that were taking advantage of our green program already. And 41% of them said, the reason I want solar is to lower my monthly bill. Right? That's what most of us want, to lower that monthly bill. And then the next largest group said, we just want to disconnect from the grid. Part of it may be the, the people that think, well, if I can disconnect from the grid, I can help lower those CO2 emissions, I can do things to make the earth more sustainable. And that's a noble cause, but there are some difficulties with that. And that's part of that 21% environment. I look at these two and I think that these groups, even though they're different questions, I think that the second group really did have that in mind when they thought about employment. And then finally, 15% of our customers said, I don't want any of those, I didn't want to do any of those things, I just want to be uh, more, do my part as a citizen. So let's look at renewable standards. I talked about the Clean Power Plan and 111D and what that means as a country reducing 30% emissions, CO2 emissions, by the year 2030. But we're not alone. In the United States, 37 states already have in guidelines. And so some of those, and there's a difference, 29 of the states, these are the ones in green, actually have mandates, or we call those standards in our business. And a standard says that if we generate electricity, a certain percentage has to be renewable green. And if you do not meet that standard, there will be a cost penalty. Secondly, you will see that you have states that have RPS goals. Sometimes these will be called renewable energy uh, standards or re, re, uh, excuse me, renewable energy portfolios. But the goals are different. Is they're, they're just suggestions. Here's what we're going to try to attain. But if we don't meet it, there's not a penalty. So some people would say that we need more goals. You notice what here in the southeast. So I work for Georgia Power, which is part of a, a larger company called Southern Company. And we have Alabama, Southern, a little bit of Gulf in here, and then Mississippi is basically this part. And you notice we don't have any of those. But I will tell you this, we are the largest investor-owned utility, or we have the largest renewable portfolio of any investor-owned utility and we did that without mandates. 
So that for people that do not think that there's not the ability to do that in a capitalistic society, I would say, look what we're doing in the Southeast. There is a, there's the ability. So, what have we seen? Solar PV installations. Part of this, like we said earlier, has been driven by the tax credit. Second is because the cost of solar panels has dropped significantly. And so, if you'll look, you'll see residential, non-residential, and utility. Non-residential is more like the commercial side. You may have a large business, Walmart, Home Depot, it says, Ikea says, we're going to be energy independent, we're putting those. They're not industrial customers, those are commercial customers. Industrial commercial customers to us are the larger scale big farms, thousand megawatts or so, large scale farms. And then residential, most of those are solar. You'll see that, oh, you know, rooftop. You'll see that residential is kept pace with non-residential, but what you'll see is the utility scale is huge. Any idea why utility scale has gone so far? I gave you the answer in the first slide, which was the 30% tax credit. When you apply a tax credit, who do you think is building the, the solar farms in the city? Taxpayers. Well, taxpayers are subsidizing at a 30% tax credit to major businesses. Now, I'm not getting into the politics of that because we see that there needs to be a balanced portfolio for the carbon emissions and everything else. But what I'm saying is large investor grade have taken advantage of the system, just like we all, when we do our taxes, we want to go find the best accountant to take advantage of the rules. And that's what they've done. They saw that they can make a profit or recover tax credits, which they can turn around and trade or sell and make good money at it. So I think that's why you see a large jump in the investor side or the utility grade. 